Hi, I'm Miri and welcome to Quo Mode. In this episode, I'm going to introduce you to a tool that's going to help your creativity in five distinct ways. One, it's going to help you get over any creative block. So writer's block, not a problem. Two, it's going to help you consistently generate more ideas and ideas that you like. Three, it's also going to help you craft that brand identity, that uniquely you look you're going for. Four, it can also help you learn the technical aspects of your craft. And five, it's going to help you gain confidence because this tool can also be played as a game, which means you're going to be practicing your craft, you're going to be perfecting your craft in a fun and supportive and challenging environment. The tool I'm talking about is a creativity deck. Now, in the rest of this video, I'm going to briefly explain why I am so confident making the claims that I've made. And I invite you to stick around, not just to hear my explanation, but because I'm also going to tell you where you can get your free conversion pack so that you can turn any deck of cards into the creativity deck that I'm talking about. All right, there's a lot of material to cover, so let's get started. So first things first, what is a creativity deck? Well, a creativity deck is essentially a deck of cards. Only on the front face of each card is a prompt that is meant to stimulate you into looking at the problem you've been grappling with in a new light. Now, in a traditional lateral thinking setting, this prompt will take the form of a new context or a unique perspective, or even some random element that you need to compare and contrast your original idea to so that you can see new details emerging from your original problem. And the value of having it in a deck format is that you can randomize these prompts simply by shuffling the cards. So I've just explained to you a traditional creativity deck, and I've done this so that when I explain to you how this deck is different, you have enough information so that you can make up your own mind as to whether or not I have any validity to the claims I've just made earlier in this video. So the main difference of this deck is that the prompt on the front of each card is an action, not a context, not some unique perspective that you need to adopt and not some random element that you need to bring in to your project just to see it in a new light. It's an action. So first of all, theoretically, this means that it's applicable to any project and to any domain. Second, because it's an action, it doesn't force the perspective shift. It triggers it. So it triggers the correct mindset, that lateral thinking shift mindset that you want in order to overcome your problem. It triggers it naturally without forcing any random elements to come into the project. So the work you do is always going to be relevant and it's not forced work. It's not contrived. Now, because it triggers rather than forces this shift in mindset, I call these actions triggers. So here on end, I'm going to be referring to these actions, these prompts that are that appear on the front face of each card. I'm going to be referring to them as triggers. So the other thing about these triggers is that they're not just selected at random. They were deliberately chosen from research into how people behave during the development process. These are actions that would naturally happen when developing an idea. So you can be guaranteed that the work you do by applying these actions is work that you would have done anyway to develop your idea. So with this deck of cards, no work is wasted. You can be guaranteed that the outcomes that you have at the end of doing this work will be a lot closer to what you're looking for than if you introduce some random element like you do in a traditional deck. The last and probably the most important advantage of these triggers is that they come together in a really easy to understand framework. And the value of this framework is that you have a system now that you can work within. You can work towards the limit, you can work towards the bounds, you can customize it so it works exactly for you. Doing this means you can work on your project piecemeal without losing any value. You can learn from others, incorporate things, but most of all, you can use this framework in order to build an understanding about your craft, an understanding about your project and about the techniques in such a way that you no longer need to rely on what the so-called experts tell you. You can make value judgments yourself 
and be really confident that these value judgments are of high quality. So basically what I'm trying to say here is that the value of this deck is that the prompts are actions. The actions don't force a change, they trigger one, so it's a lot more natural. These triggers themselves come from research, so the work you'd be doing would be work you'd be doing anyway, so no work is wasted. And finally, and most importantly, the triggers all come from a very solid framework so you can learn, you can customize, and you can make value decisions without having to rely on an expert. Okay, so now I've explained the difference between a traditional deck and this particular creativity deck. And I hope you can start to see that the power in this deck is the framework. Now, if you still haven't made up your mind, let me explain why I'm so confident in making these claims. So I started researching this process originally to help my uh, product design students overcome a few creative blocks that I found they were having. The main one was um, writer's block or whatever you want to call the equivalent for a product designer. And the second one was that really daunting deer in the headlights moment of how do I destroy the blank page? And the interesting thing about these two problems is that it's not a lack of ideas. You see, the problem isn't that you have no idea. The problem is that you judge every idea that comes to your mind as not worthy. So the lateral thinking techniques that we developed, you know, introduce something random, uh, try and compare and contrast, get your mind to think about the problem in some new way. Those strategies relied on new data, new contexts, new information to sort of inspire the student to be confident that they could then take that idea and work forward with it. What I found was that's not what the problem is. The problem is that these students had no confidence in their ability to develop an idea, no matter how bad that idea was, to develop it into something worthwhile. So I started looking at the actions of what you need to do to develop something such that you had so much confidence in your ability to develop, you could lower the standard of that initial idea to the point where it wasn't even original anymore. And this meant you didn't have writer's block and you didn't worry about what idea you were starting with with the blank page because it didn't matter how bad that starting idea was. You had confidence in your ability to apply enough changes that if the idea was bad or if you, you know, just took your competitor's idea, that you could change it enough so that it would be good, it would be relevant, and it would be unique and completely yours. And so that's where this idea came from. So as I worked with these actions and got students to learn to develop their ideas, I began to find that the shift in lateral thinking happened naturally, mostly because by asking the student to do something they wouldn't normally have done at that time, I was disrupting their normal flow of thought. And by disrupting their normal flow of thought, uh, they started to look at the problem again in new light. And because we were using techniques that helped them develop an idea, they were in the mindset that they were gonna change the idea anyway. And things just kind of happened from there. And I can guarantee you that somewhere along the process, you get inspired and that takes over. So in the end, using actions turned out to help the creative process in three ways. The first one was it gave confidence that you could develop any idea into something good as long as you kept developing it and developed it enough. Two, it allowed you to lower the standard of that initial idea so that you could jump into the development process a lot faster and you didn't have to rely on having some brilliant inspiration for that first idea that you then developed again later on. And third, by randomizing these triggers, these actions, you basically could disrupt the normal flow of thought that led a student to get into a rut and therefore in one of the creative blocks. So this is how I believed that the action-based prompts was a lot more effective than some of the other lateral thinking techniques. This deck can help you generate more ideas. And here's why. Just think about this for a second. 
if you want to do something differently, then literally do something differently. What's that saying again? Um, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and thinking you're going to get a different result. Well, the thing is, is if we don't understand our own design process, we probably only have like three or four actions that we do consistently that have worked for us. So we get different results because we put different things in as the starting point. But over time, we're doing the same things over and over and over again. And then we find that our results are actually, well, predictable. Let me illustrate it this way. Suppose our design process could be illustrated very simply with this chessboard. Our strategy would be likened to the piece we choose to use, where the process we engage is illustrated by the movement of the piece, and where we start our entire development process can be captured by where on the board we place this piece. So of course, where we start will depend quite heavily on the context of the board, and where we end up will depend both on where we start as well as what process, or piece in this case, we chose to use. For illustration purposes, let's take the movement of the knight. This piece is the least straightforward of all the movements, and one of three that yields the most number of potential landing points. So, to illustrate my point, the knight's L-shaped movement captures the nature of a well-developed, but single, design process quite nicely. Okay, suppose you start on a white square. So white becomes your initial idea, and then you apply the process, so in this case the movement of the knight, you end up on one of several possible black squares. So as an analogy, success! We started somewhere, we did something, and we ended up somewhere else, not too close to our starting point, and so the outcome looks really different. That is essentially the ideal of what we are trying to get out of the development process. However, to truly get a large number of possible outcomes, we need to start changing either our starting point, meaning we're now relying on having many initial ideas, or by changing the context, which in this analogy means by changing the landscape of the board. This is what lateral thinking techniques do. They introduce new information, like new starting points, or a new detail, or some new context, in order to generate multiple answers. And not knowing our design process means we have a very limited number of pieces we know how to use. On the other hand, if we have several techniques available to us, then we can start using multiple techniques to get our different answers. Here's what I mean. Back in the chess analogy, if we take all of our different chess pieces and apply those movements, we get more outcomes. And if we apply those movements in combination with each other, well, we can effectively have unlimited flexibility and can land anywhere on the board. All of this without having to change our starting point. This is the point I'm trying to get at with this particular creativity deck. Simply knowing the triggers will already greatly improve one's ability to add more techniques to the development process. And learning multiple ways to use each technique will only make you that much more powerful. And of course, Learning to use the techniques in combination with each other, well, well, that's what the whole game portion of this tool is about. So, I'm sure you get the point. By having multiple techniques at your fingertips, you can consistently and reliably generate more options from that one starting point. And voila! Here is a consistent and reliable way that you can get many different outcomes from the same starting point. One question that I get asked quite a lot is how can a fixed framework yield something unique for every single person who tries to use it? Now, don't get me wrong, this is a really good question. So let me just tell you a small story so you can understand where I'm coming from. When I was a lot younger, I knew this guy who was an amazing musician. He was so good, I was so jealous of his talent, he could basically listen to anyone and emulate them, play anything. And that went for multiple instruments as well. Now, the problem with him is that he was so resistant to learning. This is probably because he could so easily and effortlessly copy whatever style he heard 
that he didn't really have to pay attention. He didn't have to learn what it was in the technique that led to that style because he just, well, did it. You see, he believed that the technique you learned determined the style you played in, rather than understanding that a technique is supposed to be there as a tool to help you do the style that you want. So he didn't learn many techniques, which meant he didn't have much technique to fall back on. So of course, when he did fall back on something, it ended up being exactly that style. Now, the other problem he had is that he didn't understand the techniques or how the techniques were used in order to create that style. So all he could do was copy. And if you copy someone, then yes, absolutely guaranteed, you're not gonna be doing something unique. So the key thing here is to have many techniques for a given effect so that you can pick and choose the techniques that really embody your style. And more than that is to understand how the elements of the technique come together to create that effect so that you can even customize the technique, thereby ensuring that what you do is going to be exactly your style. And that's how it relates to this deck. So there are three key things that make this deck really valuable. The first is that while there are 36 triggers, you're not actually meant to apply these triggers in isolation of each other. So you take your initial idea and you're actually supposed to apply a stack of triggers. And if you watch any of my videos, you'll see, I always recommend between three and five to start with. And the idea here is that, yes, there might be 36 triggers, but when you start applying them in combination with each other, that number 36 becomes exponentially large. Think about it as the notes in a musical scale. There might be only 12 notes, but when you put them in combination with each other and you add everything else like rhythm and so on and so forth, you get an infinite number of possible outcomes. And that is why there is so much beautiful music in this world. The second thing about this framework is that there might be 36 triggers, but that's 36 concepts of things you could do not 36 techniques. You see, for every concept, for every trigger, there are a plethora of techniques that you can use to embody that trigger. So really, there's probably an infinite number of techniques that can be used in this deck, even though there's a finite number of triggers, of suggestions of what you can do to change an idea. And the wonderful thing about this is that you can then pick and choose the techniques that work for you for each given trigger. So really, the way you interpret trigger one and the way you interpret trigger two, especially with the point I made before that they go in combination with each other, is again, going to be very unique than anyone else. And the third reason why this framework is so valuable is because it actually provides a language of understanding. And by having this language, you can now analyze the works of others and learn what they did in order to achieve the effects that they're achieving. It creates an understanding about the technique that, that goes beyond just copying. So you're never going to fall into that trap of, ooh, I really like that effect. Let me just copy what they did. So the value of having this framework is that it gives you a language by which you can articulate the processes that you see in somebody else's work. So you can analyze their work and learn from that work and really craft your own unique embodiments of each one of these triggers. Now, this one might feel a little bit counterintuitive. I mean, after all, how can techniques for creative thinking help you with something as boring as technical mastery? Well, I admit I was pretty surprised to learn this as well, but then I looked into it a little bit further and discovered that it's pretty simple actually, because the mindset that you need for creative thinking is incredibly similar to the mindset you need for learning. Now, I'm not gonna bore you with theory in this video, but if you do like that stuff, and I love that stuff, check out some of our courses because I do discuss it there. All to summarize here to make my point is think about creativity and learning from the following perspective. To be creative, you essentially need to make the familiar unfamiliar and the unfamiliar, familiar. And by doing this, you can see things in a new light. Now, this has been sort of a founding concept of creativity since like the 60s. Whereas the basic principle behind learning is to make the unfamiliar, familiar. I mean, after all, 
that's how we learn things, right? We start off, we don't know what we're learning. We learn it, it becomes familiar, we know it. But true mastery is about being able to generalize and then place that newly found familiar once again in an unfamiliar context. So the mindsets behind creativity and learning are both about making the unfamiliar familiar and dealing with the familiar in unfamiliar ways. I'm claiming you can gain creative confidence by using this deck mostly because it will allow you to practice your creative techniques frequently and in a non-threatening environment. And it does this because you can turn this deck into a game deck. Any game you play from this is going to be like a cross between Pictionary, where there's a performance aspect, uh, Cards Against Humanity, where there's a creative aspect, and Poker, where there's a strategic and rules-based aspect. And you can combine all of these three in rapid games so that you can practice your ideas and the application of your techniques, your triggers, in a non-threatening environment. One where the worst that'll happen is everyone will get a good laugh and you've learned something. Now the way these games work are pretty simple. At the end of this video, I'm going to link you to the rules for Trigger Tower, which I recommend as the first game you try. It's got a solitaire version, which translates easily into a dual version, which translates very seamlessly into like a round robin for three or more players. But the way all of these games work is simple. You start with an initial idea. It doesn't matter. It could be something as simple as Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. You then create a stack of triggers, so like between three and five triggers, that you then have to apply and develop that initial idea and then perform that idea. And you can create these stacks in different ways for the different games by either drawing randomly or selecting really hard triggers to trip your friends up. But then when you perform them, you get to see how others embody those triggers. You get to see how you embody those triggers and you get to test out and try, did this work, did this not? And it's, it's not in a work environment, so there are no consequences beyond a good laugh with some good friends. And when you find yourself winning all the time, well, hey, that's got to boost your confidence. Okay, so let me just summarize everything I've said to you so far. We use actions instead of contexts or perspective shifts in order to trigger you into being more creative. I've explained to you how this helps get over a creative block. I've explained how this helps you consistently and reliably create more ideas. I've explained how the framework allows you to learn, to analyze, and gives you a language so that you can craft your own style and be really uniquely you. I've also very briefly explained how the learning mindset and the creativity mindset are very similar. And so you can actually use the triggers, these actions to help yourself learn technical aspects of your craft so that you can focus on some of the more important things like the music or the art or the meaning of what you're trying to convey. And then lastly, I've explained how you can gain confidence by playing these triggers as a game, by practicing these triggers in game format because you get to practice often and you get to practice in a non-threatening environment. So hopefully I've given you enough information that you can actually make up your own mind as to whether or not my claims are valid. If you want to know more, you're always welcome to visit our website, sign up for the courses, uh, have a read of the blogs, or even just check out our YouTube channel where we're going to be posting lots of content that is just basically going to cover all aspects of everything that I just talked about. If you've liked this video, or at least the ideas inside, please like and subscribe to my channel. There, you're also going to find videos on how to do the five things that I've talked about, workshops on how to use the triggers more effectively, and even actual application of how to use the framework as an analysis tool and as a learning tool. And of course, I have the game rules up on my channel, so please go check them out. This way you can challenge your friends and you can practice your craft and you can claim creative mastery. But of course, to get started, what you need to do first is go to my website, download the free conversion pack that I'm offering so that you can turn any deck of cards into a creativity deck so you can get started 
because the most important thing is have fun learning. Happy creating!